Hello and welcome to Critical Line Item. My name's Tom Ramblick. Thank you for joining me for this particular podcast. Now, the financial services sector is a very vibrant sector. It's big, it's important. And every um, every six months, there is, uh, for want of a better term, a beauty parade of analysis that comes out on how the banks have performed and what their key data uh, that means. Um typically done by accounting firms and, and, and also others. But today we've got the, uh, the EY, Oceana Banking and Capital Markets Leader, uh, Doug Nixon, who's going to take us through what the bank banking results tell us about the sector, how vibrant it is, where the weaknesses are, and uh, even possibly looking at where the sector is at as it, as we've emerged out of COVID. Now, Doug, thank you so much for joining me. Tom, great to be speaking with you today. And so thank you. Ab- absolutely right. The, the major banks uh, have finished reporting results, and it's and it is a solid set of results. Certainly, with some tailwinds from this this upward trajectory in the rate cycle. Really, in as you hinted at, in a uh, entering into an uncertain period ahead. Combined cash earnings of 28.5 billion, about up about seven percent across the across the market. Net interest margin is actually down 11 basis points. But Tom, that's a tale of two halves. Uh, it's been trending upward in the second half. Credit impairments down by about 680 million across the sector. An average return on equity of 10.6 percent, which is up 65 basis points. The results show we're at this really interesting inflection point with a rapid increase in cash rates boosting NIM in the second half, but the full impact of inflation and rates not yet making its way through the system. The really interesting is this mixed results on operational expenses that we've seen. Um, There's been very, very strong management of operational expense across the industry, but this tight labour market that we're in, the the post-COVID labour market and inflationary pressures have meant that expenses have actually increased year on year. So a solid set of results with some tailwinds, but certainly industry is facing into a very volatile period there. You mentioned um, the environment that we've got right now with increases in in interest rates and the impact that's having. in your engagement with the sector, uh, how how are people reflecting on that current the current climate we have? Yes, yeah, so it's a very good question, Tom. Um, so, we've exited COVID, and and really, actually, exited COVID, and what I I think of as the post GFC era as well with two, two facets. One, we've got a very well capitalised financial services industry. A lot of the, the efforts of APRA and their peers around the world to, to strengthen the industry, you know, that's now in effect and that's a very good thing. We've also had some very careful provision management through COVID, um, which we get the benefit of carrying over into, into this very unusual period where we're entering into. So that, that gives a quite a strong foundation to the to the system, the financial system, as we enter into this very volatile, this kind of very dynamic period where we're going through. We haven't yet seen, we're only starting to see early signs of um, of the downside of those those rate increases. So I mentioned before, we've seen the inflationary expect, uh, aspects start to creep into the financial results. So. Rising, rising wages, a tight labour market, and general inflationary pressures on expenses, but we haven't yet seen um, the the increase in rates manifest um, in, in industry. Um, you know, that's really if you, if you listen to a lot of the commentary that was provided by various institutions through the reporting season, the earnings season, um, they really expect that to manifest you know, twelve to eighteen months out from now. Any environment that is inflationary, um, any environment where interest rates rise, comes with another risk, and that is, 
you know, there are people who are who may struggle to pay their loans uh, as a result of um, you know, financial distress and financial pressure. Um, is that coming up in your engagement with people in the banking sector in terms of what the what the likelihood is of you know the, the failure of people to be able to to stump up the funds to to pay off what they borrowed? Um, so I guess there's two observations I'd have on that, Tom. One is um, this high interest rate environment is not a phenomenon that is um, unique to the Australian environment. Uh, okay. Every every economy around the world that I can think of um, has had this period of very rapid rises in asset prices, including including house prices, very low interest rates um, that meant that business and consumers have been borrowing um, in that larger numbers in that environment than than historically not. Uh, the second one is that having a very strong and healthy financial system means that individual players within that system have more options to deploy uh, in periods of stress. And that can be everything from um, uh, recasting recasting loan terms, so ext extending loans out to get monthly repayments, um, monthly repayments down. And the other interesting facet at the moment is just the amount of equity that's been built up for those that have been in the housing market for some time. And the amount of equity that's been built up and household savings that have been built up through this, this period now. But as you rightly point out, it is a very, it is a period that, um, you know, every participant has to be actively managing in um, because it is a, a period of change and, and change means volatility. One of the things that um, your uh, your media release certainly highlights, and it's fairly prominent in the minds of a range of people now, and that is uh, the need for corporations and, it, and to some extent individuals themselves uh, to be cyber resilient, if we can use the the modern jargon um, <laughs> to protect yourself from the nasties on the internet and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, the we've had incidents such as sort of there'd been something that some old data that Telstra had uh, that appeared somewhere. Optus has had its problems. Medibank has had its problems. Um, uh, are the banks? Uh, well prepared to to withstand those kinds of uh, attacks in, in your view? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tom, it is um, a topic that is top of mind for a lot of people, uh, a lot of people at the moment, have been, as you point out some very high-profile high incidents out in the market um, that have had a personal impact to, to, to many, many Australians. The financial services sector, cyber security in the financial services sector is not a, is not a, a, new, a new thing. And, and to my, I think you and I might be about the, the same age, I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Um, but, I'm about, um, no, yeah, yeah, um, I'm just over the hill. I'm 51. <laughs> so we're not, not too far off in age. And um, <laughs> and for as long as I've, I've been around and as long as we've been around, uh, there has been capital expenditure on, on cyber resilience. And I, I can remember mm. hearing the term CISO in the early, in the early noughties, late, late 90s, early, early noughties, and there was already you know, industry associations, et cetera. So the banks have had CISOs or chief information security officers in place for, you know, decades now, I, I, I guess, and capital expenditure um, to protect their assets um, for just as long. 
Now, there's no doubt that in a period of um, geopolitical volatility, um, additional funds would be put to those teams to ensure that um, the, um, the capability was um, as up to date as, as possibly as possible. There's also another aspect I think which has probably got um, broader broader implications for for not only the FS industry but every industry, which is um, you know the crossover the crossover effect where you have you know a data breach in one institution uh, that means that there is an impact on another financial institution. So. Um, for example, um, uh, um, pushing up call volumes and on call centres and meaning that institutions have to be very, very dy dynamic in responding to market events, even if it isn't touching their institution because there might be some, uh, uh, some reciprocal um, impact on their institution. The the other thing that's interesting as well in terms of you know, the, the sort of that cyber resilience space is how you um, how you not only protect consumer data um, but also how you protect corporate secrets. Mm. Um, yeah, the consumer data is, is one thing, but the other the other element. Uh, obviously, is internal company records and, and uh, etc. Uh, do uh, do banks, to your knowledge, distinguish between those two, or do they treat them as um, as data that must be protected, protected irrespective of class? Um, <clears throat> Tom, I won't um, I won't hypothesise on. On frameworks and methodologies that individuals will, individual institutions will deploy in, in protecting their data. Um, uh, from what I've observed across the industry, I haven't come across an institution that doesn't have um, an extensive list of um, key risk indicators across cybersecurity, whether that be internal data, employee data, um, customer data and have um, significant investment to, across all of those in order to protect it for the institution. Um, to the extent that you can, uh, uh, you know, we, I mean, the banking sector is a sector that has multiple layers of regulation. One of those is the... the, the the regulation the government imposes on entities who are deemed to be sort of key infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, types uh, in relation to their data and data security and, and all that kind of thing. What are your observations on the way they see that element of um, that element of regulation, given that they uh, they have to deal with APRA, they've got to deal with ASIC, they've got to deal with uh, uh, um, you know, Fair Work Commission, they've got to deal with all of the imaginable regulatory structures, and then you've got the um, the issues related to um, cyber resilience on top of that. <laughs> and, and Tom, um, very. Very timely question. Uh, APRA over the last you know, two years have in particular have updated their requirements in this space or additional requirements for external reviews, for example, now. Um, I, I think that there is a, a broad recognition that collectively the financial system is an incredibly important piece of infrastructure for the Australian economy and as it is for any economy around, around the world. And like any important infrastructure, uh, there are mechanisms that we as a society put in place around those institutions to keep them safe, to ensure that they function as they're supposed to, to make sure that they are resilient. And I think, I, I think the industry as a whole um, generally sees that as a, positive, as a positive thing. And it lets them think about um, aspects that they might not normally 
not not normally think about in their in their everyday everyday operations. Now, there's always going to be a, a natural tension a tension there, as you rightly point out. There are quite a lot of overlapping regulations out there in the market, but broadly recognition that the intent of those regulations is to provide a safe and sound financial system for the Australian economy. Now, I'm, I'm aware that, uh, you know, that we're, um, we're coming close to, to our time together, as they say in the classics, but it's probably a good question that, that, that we need to wrap things up with, um, being that of the sort of the omnipresent coronavirus pandemic and um, how banks are coping with it. Uh, uh, what it, are there any observations from your conversations with people from from, from you know the, the sort of internal chatter that you have in amongst the financial services team at EY as to how you know, the, what the what the sort of impacts have been uh, on the sector and where they're gradually moving out of uh, you know, that sort of pandemic state? Yeah, Tom. Um, a few, a few that I, a few that I can that, that come to mind. Um, firstly, um, I, I think, and I mentioned this before, uh, the financial system, and, and we should be very thankful for um, essentially the mechanisms that were deployed during that period when we thought the worst. You know, we, we all thought well, this is this could be very, very bad. Um, that the mechanisms that the industry deployed to ensure that they'd be um, uh, conservative, safe and sound through, through that period. And in particular, I'm referring to a lot of the provisions that the banks put in place um, in expectations that, um, uh, that credit, uh, credit defaults might rise. And we were able to leverage those as an industry and as an economy into this period of volatility. Um, so that's... Um, I think for many actors in um, across the market here, that's that's a very good thing. The second observation I'd have, um, and you know, it's like when we're sitting here talking over Zoom, you know, I think COVID pushed a lot more of us into the digital age and modernised a lot of us and and a lot of institutions in the digital age in a way that wouldn't have happened in an ordinary course of business. And that's enabled all sorts of different hybrid working arrangements, remote working arrangements, um, and and that has also enabled the industry to provide services to customers in a way that maybe wasn't possible before or allow customers to interact with institutions that wasn't possible before um, and employees as well. And that's I think that's a, that's a, that's a good thing for everyone as well. The th- the third observation I would have, and probably the, the most trying aspect of COVID, is this kind of very crazy thing that we wouldn't have predicted, which is the, the job market. I mean, to, to think that we're sitting um, in this period of you know, ultra employment where vacancy rates for almost every single industry in the country um, are, are very, very high. That's that's created a problem for the industry in two ways. One, um, uh, managing operational expenses um, and wage inflation, which manifests in the balance sheet. Um, And secondly, and probably the the hardest thing is just finding talent out in the marketplace. Um, And and we want want that system to have talent, to modernise, to um, to continually um, reinvent itself. And to do that, it needs to have talent. Now, the uh, the report and the media release and, and other bits and pieces the firm's got on the performance of the banks this year appear um, online. Where can where can people wanting to learn more about it go? Uh, so, um, Tom, we've we've released our analysis on. Uh, our website ey.com. You can also just search on Google for EY 2022 bank results, uh, and that'll take you to, to our website as well. 
and also for those of your listeners on LinkedIn, we've certainly got plenty of uh, plenty of materials available there through to our um, our interactive website on our result analysis as well. I've been talking to uh, the EFIS Oceania head of the financial services uh, division, Doug Nixon. Uh, Doug, thank you for joining me. Tom, thank you very much for having me. And, uh, thank you.